Every day, my grandfather went to work with the selfless intent of helping somebody else. Specializing in infertility, he went above and beyond for his patients because for him, if he was helping to give somebody hope and happiness, then he was completely fulfilled. I think what inspired me most was not his job, but really the way he chose to live his life. It was he measured his happiness in the ways that he was helping others. And that continues to inspire me as one day I hope to have a career that will enable me to help people. And I want to be a doctor and medical researcher just like him. But until high school, I never really formally acted upon this passion until I elected to take an independent science research course, and each student does a project. So I was really excited to make my project that somehow in any scale, big or small, would impact somebody and give them hope or help them in some way. But that's a pretty broad topic, so I didn't really know exactly what I wanted to do. But um I started looking in the news, and that was during the 2014 Ebola outbreak. And what really shocked me was how exponential the growth of the outbreak seemed and how out of control it was. And so I really started looking into how to limit this growth. So this outbreak, um, over 28,000 people were infected and 11,000 people died. And up to 90% of those infected with Ebola will die, but with early medical intervention, that number will decrease by 50%. But these numbers don't reflect at all the toll that deaths like these have on families and communities, because what happens is now a generation of children are orphaned and teachers um, are no longer around to teach their students. So it really tears apart the socioeconomic fabric of these communities. So what I really began to focus on was how can we limit the spread of outbreaks like this. So the containment diagnosis and treatment of disease is one of the critical challenges that faces our world today. Um, but it's so important because with asymptomatic diagnosis, and when somebody is asymptomatic, that means that they are not showing symptoms, but also they're not contagious. So if you're able to diagnose somebody while they're asymptomatic, then you're able to give them early medical intervention and increase their likelihood of survival, but also you're able to isolate them and break the dangerous chain of transmission. So that's critical in outbreaks like this. But while this solution seems simple, what I really began to realize is that we don't have mass diagnostic tools that are able to diagnose the amount of people that we need. And I was really inspired by the courage of aid workers that went over to Africa where the um, outbreak was most prevalent, like Dr. Ken Brantley, who actually went to Africa to help, and he contracted Ebola himself. And I was so inspired by their compassion that they showed in the face of this tragedy. And even though often they weren't directly affected, they felt compelled to go and help. And I think that really underscores a point that we're all members of a global community, and it's our collective moral obligation to help. So I began looking at how we could better arm these aid workers with tools, not only to protect themselves, but better diagnose and protect the people where the outbreaks were most prevalent. So I started looking into the diagnostic tools that are used currently. And what I found is that there's a series of barriers that prevents them from being mass viable solutions. Often they're really expensive, they aren't really portable, they are, um, require a lot of time and training because they're very complicated to use, and they're also extremely temperature dependent. So this means that they need an unbroken cold chain of refrigeration from point of manufacture to point of administration. And this is just not practical at all in these areas where there's poor infrastructure and intermittent electricity. So I began looking at how can we make other temperature dependent things temperature independent. And actually, through a series of Google searches, I found a TED Talk by, done by um, Professor Fio Amanetto, and he was talking about the properties of silk. So silk, often we think of as just a material for making clothing, but actually, um, if you're able to get the silk fibroin, which is the protein of the silk cocoon, then it has a series of properties that makes it a great biomaterial. It's biocompatible, really strong, and when it's in film form, it forms a perfect crystal, and it has temperature stabilizing properties. 
So what I found is that people are trying to apply this to vaccines because vaccines are very temperature dependent and make them temperature independent. So that prompted me to think, why can't this same concept be applied to the reagents of an ELISA kit, which is the current method for detecting Ebola? So as this graphic shows, an ELISA kit works by exhibiting a color change when there has been a manual piling of reagents in a specific order in the presence of a sample. And if that sample has the target antigen, then it will change colors. So this is a very accurate method for diagnosing disease, not only Ebola, but other diseases and, um, and viruses. But the problem is it's, as I mentioned before, expensive, not really portable. It requires a plate reader to be read that links it back to needing electricity. It also is extremely temperature dependent. So what I did is I emailed Dr. Fio Almanetto, and he's a big, big scientist, so I didn't expect anything from a random high schooler from Connecticut, but he responded right away. So I was so excited to have the opportunity to meet with him, and I was just so inspired by what he had to say. And I think that it's through this meeting with him that I really, my research process truly began. So what I set out to do was apply this silk solution to the temperature dependent reagents of an ELISA kit and make the silk solution temperature independent. I just wanted to solve one of the problems with the ELISA kit, it's temperature dependency. So I did this and once the ELISA kit was made temperature independent, I still didn't see it as a viable mass diagnostic tool because it was so expensive, because it wasn't really portable, because it was so complicated to use. And so I began looking at if I could not use the well plate format, which is kind of like the white square on one of the photos. And I began looking at how I could apply it to a lateral flow format. So it'd be a totally visual test, kind of like a pregnancy test. So um, once I had done this process, I actually created the Ebola assay card, which I call the EAC. And this test is temperature independent. It is sustainable using only filter paper and photo paper compared to the plastics and wasted reagents of the ELISA kit. It's also portable. It's just the size of about a card. and can be dropped at travel checkpoints, um, areas with high infection rates, and it's a totally visual process. So it transcends language barriers. Also, this test is rapid. It takes the um, protocol of the ELISA kit down from two hours to 30 minutes, and this test is much cheaper. It's $5 compared to the $1,000 of the ELISA kit, so it could really be used on the mass scale. So, um, this video actually shows the test working and how easy it is to use, which is also critical. So all you need to do is put the sample on the first semicircle load spot and water on the rest, and the reagents are released from the silk film and they flow towards the center detection zone. And if the person is infected with Ebola, then there will be a blue color change followed by a yellow color change. So um, the uniquely shaped load spots are also to increase the ease of use and make sure that it can be a totally visual process and there's no instruction manual needed. So as you see, this is the blue color change happening and then the yellow color change. And this whole process takes about 30 minutes. This is on time lapse. So um, after this, I was honored to enter my work in the 2015 Google Science Fair and I actually won that fair. Um, the Google Science Fair, <laughs> thank you, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, the Google Science Fair is an online STEM competition that is dedicated to really just letting students around the world, regardless of their age or background or socio socioeconomic status, um, just voice their ideas about STEM and communicate with each other, other students around the world, but also a variety of scientific leaders in different fields. And Google, the Google Science Fair sponsors, Google, Virgin Galactic, Lego, National Geographic, and Scientific American are dedicated to encouraging students in STEM but also they stress the importance of having mentors. And I could not have found this to be any more true. And I'm so grateful to my mentors throughout this whole process. My science research teacher, Mr. Andrew Bermonti, whose wisdom and excellence and just commitment to teaching me and all his students guided me every day. And he taught me, don't be discouraged by the inevitable setbacks of the research process. And I think this is really true because what I found is every day, one thing wouldn't go as planned. Something would go really wrong or sometimes it would go really right. But every outcome, whether it was expected or unexpected, taught me something valuable that I used in the future. And I think that can be applied to any facet of life, whether it's in STEM or any other area. 
And I'm also grateful to Professor Fio Manetto and his colleague, Dr. Benedetto Morelli, for consulting with me initially about the Silk Films and just continuing to mentor me. So I think it's critical to have these mentors. And after the Google Science Fair, I was honored to receive a letter from Dr. Kent Brantley, which kind of brought it whole circle for me because he was my initial inspiration. And I just wanted to share one quote from his letter with you that I think really speaks um, what he acted upon, but also I think what we should all strive to act upon. And he said, when we all choose to treat each other with compassion and respect to seek the good of others above our own interests, then the world will be a better place. And so I think this really speaks to the collective moral obligation we have to act as a global community and take a proactive approach and not just rely on the leaders of scientific fields. Because I think what Dr. Ken Brantley saw and we're all seeing is that we're only as healthy and as safe and as assured as the weakest country or individual among us. And it's up to us to help those in need, whether it affects us directly or not. And I think what I also learned throughout this process is often when something, someone young achieves something, people say, oh, they did this and they're this how old and they're so young. And often I think people look at youth as an obstacle that has to be overcome in order to be successful. But I found just the opposite. I think the excitement, energy, and engagement of youth should always be considered an enormous advantage because when you're young, you're less likely to see roadblocks and barriers that adults see and look at the problem more holistically and purely. And youth, I believe, is often the perspective you must look at problems through in order to see solutions. I think it's critical to remember that. And my advice to young girls in STEM is the same advice I have to all young people. Believe in yourself, don't get discouraged, and don't think that there, everything that there has to be done has already been done. I think it's really easy to fall into that trap or also think that that problem's too big or that problem's insignificant. If you do anything that affects anyone anywhere, I think it's progress. And often, if you look at a series of failures, sometimes they make the best successes. So it's always important to remember that there's always room for innovation and creative reconsideration. What I have learned most of all in this process is what a powerful force science is for change and hope. I believe science is the path to the transformative change that the world needs and that everyone has a role to play in that process. Um, I've also seen that it is so important to think globally, reconsider existing solutions, and always ask, why not?